Welcome everyone and thank you for uh, joining us for today's installment of uh, the fall seminar series hosted by the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies at Samuel Fraser University. My name is Dimitris Kralis. I'm the director of the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies and will be moderating the uh, talk uh, today and the conversation. Uh, each year we invite scholars working in different aspects of uh, Hellenic studies to present their research on a wide range of topics in the fields of uh, archaeology, classics, uh, Byzantine, Ottoman, and modern Greek history, as well as uh, literary and cultural studies. Before we begin, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this event is taking place at Simon Fraser University on Burnaby Mountain on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Slaytooth, Masquiam, and Kuvaklam peoples. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we get going, I would like to remind um, everyone that this uh, webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions or concerns about SFU's uh, Zoom uh, privacy and security guidelines, I would ask you to visit uh, SFU IT Services uh, website. By this point, however, you're already here, so it's perhaps too late. Uh, online audience, uh, if we run into a technical uh, uh, problem, we will uh, update you. Uh, in the chat, but please know that this event is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel at a later date. You're aware of that? Yes. And you're okay with it? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, I'm pleased therefore to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Ian Randall, who received his PhD in archeology span in the ancient world uh, from Brown University in 2018. He has worked on anthropological questions of value and identity politics in uh, the past, in various parts of the world and now excavates at early Byzantine Blochos in Western Thessaly and at Kurion on the south, south coast of Cyprus. He's currently a postdoctoral research uh, fellow at the University of British Columbia with a database of religious history where he's the late antique uh, editor. I'll say no more and I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much and thank you all for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure to be giving this talk here today. This is actually only my second in person um, since the pandemic started. Um, and I realized during my first, uh, a couple of weeks ago at the uh, Cyprus American Archaeological Research Institute in Nicosia, I'm actually a bit rusty, so uh, bear, bear with me. <clears throat> um, I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Professor Kralis for inviting me to speak here today. Um, being a postdoc at UBC with the database of religious history and a Byzantinist, I am extremely lucky that an institution of the caliber of the Center for Hellenic Studies uh, is just a short distance away. So I look forward to seeing more of all of you in the coming months. So, oh yeah, there's my title. Um, today, I'd like to talk about ports and port society, particularly on Cyprus, uh, during the long late antiquity, from the 7th to 9th centuries, uh, and how the, the object worlds of these ports um, may have conditioned shifts in identity formation through differential experiences of space and time. We're all aware that space and time are not universal cons constants. Uh, the space of a basketball stadium um, feels very different depending on whether you are on the court or off of it. An evening with good friends uh, and food passes all too quickly, while the, that meeting over a single sad cup of coffee uh, seems to last forever. Our somatic engagement with our surroundings changes our understanding of just where we are and how time is moving around us. In thinking about space, Foucault defined what he called heterotopias, that is types of other space that stand in relation to other places, but, and I'm quoting here, in such a way as to suspect, neutralize, or invent the set of relations that they happen to designate, mirror, or reflect. They juxtapose in a single real place, several spaces, several sites that are themselves incompatible, end quote. Like all good philosophy, that's pretty dense on the surface, but becomes clearer through example. The classic one in this case, is a cemetery. A cemetery is a real place within real space that is set apart. It is liminal in the sense that it stands within, but also outside of our normal experience of space. It is both crowded and empty. Life and death meet here and coexist, two otherwise incompatible states of being. Society and the social order are reflected in the dead, yet are no longer of it. 
part of how, part of how we are clued into this liminal space is through our somatic experience of a cemetery, the quiet, the untrammeled grass, the hopefully pristine gardening that gives the sense that the area is suspended in time. Indeed, Foucault states that heterotopias only gain full capacity through um, when those within them uh, arrive at a sort of absolute break with their traditional time. A point that I'll get back to in a bit, particularly in how it relates to, to that heterotopic somascape. And don't let anyone tell you that philosophy isn't fun. But further examples of heterotopias might be a theater, um, uh, also a designated space in which the world is reflected and the actors are, themse are simultaneously themselves and not themselves, or even a mirror itself, a reflective non-spacey space within space. And of course, for our purposes, ships and ports. In a 2018 article, uh, Veku and Nilsson identified Byzantine ships and ports as meeting Foucault's criteria for heterotopias. The ship is clearly the hetero heterotopia par excellence, a floating piece of space, a place without a place, to quote Foucault again, where society is mirrored, yet illicit things can occur. This is to be contrasted with the port or harbor, a safe haven from the dangers of path passage, both natural and human, which was often protected by, nat by specific saints and churches. And see, for example, now this is the harbor church at Corian, which is right at the base of the cliff uh, on which I do a lot of my work. And there's a really good bar just off screen to the right. <clears throat> it's not too shabby. The liminal quality comes through here as well, however, with ports inhabited by strange people, often of questionable moral, moral character. This is particularly the case in Byzantine narrative traditions, where in a port, couples can express their love, laws can be openly flouted, yet moral corruption waits around every corner. Indeed, the port often serves as a metaphor for the moral dangers of life itself, the fleeting place of transition between birth and the hereafter. The port then, as heterotopia, is a liminal connective space linking the sea and distant places to the city and the hinterland. It engenders new relationships between travelers and merchants, diplomats and sailors. And here the Rhodian sea law is particularly instructive in laying out the various professions that work there as are the numerous inscriptions at uh, Korikos. And I tried to find a good slide of that, but um, they, the appropriate inscriptions only make up about 5% and my photographs were a little bit too grainy, so. As nodes of transport and trade, ports function as a vertical nexus of class relations alongside horizontal cultural interchange and confrontation. At the macro scale, there are important links in the military, economic, and administrative chain of the empire and acts as a gateway for communication, commerce, and taxation. They also have an association with the process and place of exile. And this is particularly true of island ports. I don't think I need to go into Foucault's uh, obsession with prisons. Lastly, material culture, social structure, and architecture are often specific to ports with, for example, seaside merchant houses incorporating dwelling, storage, and business administration in one, not to mention various harbor facilities oriented around ship maintenance and seaborne defense. Life then in a late antique or early medieval port must have been something indeed. The hustle and bustle, the sights, sounds and smells, people from strange places with bizarre accents, practicing specialized maritime trades, the smell of the sea, fish, and pitch, mingled with the acrid smell of campfire and stoves, the banging of hammers, and the sound of people loading and unloading cargo, the staccato of hammer blows, and the punctuation of a dropped amphora, not to mention the exotic goods and foods available. This somatic experience of a place apart, a heterotopic space, and the implications of the material culture associated with it is what I'd like to talk about today. In particular, I'd like to talk about ceramics in these heterotopias and what they can tell us about identity negotiation at a transitional point in the history of the Byzantine Empire. I do this because I think the past is good to think with when it comes to, con to considering alternatives and lessons for the present in how we relate to each other and to the things that we create, trade, and consume. 
I also think Byzantium is rather useful in this regard. Larger scale questions about our relationship to materiality and identity have often in anthropology and other disciplines been focused on societies that are far more different from our own than the Eastern Roman Empire. Leaving aside the current debate over whether or not Byzantium can be considered a nation state, I think, think it can be safely considered a state level society with a centralized bureaucracy, civil service, professional army, and a high level of monetization over most of its history. Moreover, it lasted for 1100 years, an incredibly long time in which to consider issues of identity and cultural continuity. Accepting its longevity, <clears throat> the similarities that can be drawn with our own society make those divergences that can be found um, even more instructive. And any assumption of parity in how systems and individuals articulated their relationship to material culture and identity, a lost opportunity. In considering material culture, the ways that we engage with it shape not only our consumption, but our understanding of self or who we purport to be in relation to others, which then further shapes our consumption, et cetera. This is one of the main engines that drives culture change. How, for example, do we incorporate Chinese food or Scandinavian furniture into a sense of who we are? What is the context in which we make use of one thing and not another? If, for example, I drink beer out of a stein or a solo cup, I'm sending very different messages about what kind of a person I am, um, both to myself and to others around me. Any identity association may be unconscious to the participants, but certain contexts may throw such similarities into um, stark contrast, such as an encounter with beer drinking Stein people at an informal event. The mediation that things provide in social relations is also related to issues of post-colonialism and class in the sense that issues of power are deeply embedded in questions about the reception, rejection, and a recontextualization of new forms of material culture, a particularly interesting question in the, in the reflective laboratory of a heterotopia. In focusing on ceramics, I'm targeting one aspect of the somatic experience of heterotopic space, in particular that linked to the embodied practice of consumption, which, as mentioned, is integral to identity negotiation. What we eat and how it is prepared or served evinces reactions from practically everyone, calling up regional, local, and even class-oriented associations. If we look at the contextual situation of ceramics in the past, that is the way that they acquire value through consumption, we should be able to understand shifts and negotiations in the ways that people conceptualize their identity via the mediation those ceramics performed in the very social act uh, of cooking and dining, a very embodied act. You literally take it into yourself. The archaeological context then for our heterotopic ports and questions of consumption is the rather tumultuous 7th through 9th centuries. At the macro scale, this is a fascinating period of transition in Byzantium, when the Arab conquest forced it to reorient itself around Constantinople and the role of government, Romanitas, defense, trade, and social cohesion were all being challenged. Moments of crisis and collapse are often good places to look when considering consumption-oriented issues of value. When faced with considerable change, people make decisions about their relationship to material culture that are often quite visible in the material record. Cyprus, in just a few short decades following the emergence of Islam, went from being a node of commerce and communication in the essentially Byzantine lake of the Eastern Mediterranean to a threatened border area on a maritime frontier. As an island, it stands as a particularly interesting case given that its interface with the seascape through ports was its only form of access to the rest of the empire and the wider Mediterranean world. Cyprus was attacked by the Umay Umayyad Caliph Muawiyah in 649 and 653 with this inscription from the church at Soli describing the attack as follows. Many were killed and about 120,000 were led away as prisoners. Again, subsequently, the island suffered a new invasion, more lamentable than the preceding one, in the course of which a greater number of people fell under the dagger and were led away prisoner. 
Although the attacks were no doubt devastating, with the excavation conducted at Calavasos Copetra revealing considerable damage and several bodies dumped in a village well, it is notable that the inscription at Soli was done in fine marble shortly after the raids. And recent archaeological investigations show continued habitation at all of the major sites on the island into the 8th century. Although an Arab garrison was established at Paphos, it proved short-lived, and a treaty was signed in 688 between the empire and the caliphate that established Cyprus, along with Armenia, as a demilitarized zone that would pay taxes to both empires, leaving it ostensibly free from attack. This treaty was apparently to hold with the occasional abrogation until the reconquest of the island by Byzantium in 965, although it's notable that we are not told um, by Theophanes exactly who the island was reconquered from. Um, it's an interesting point. From an economic standpoint, these centuries are marked by considerable contra contraction. Maritime trade appears to have been much disrupted and the island turned inward with a move towards the countryside and a more subsistence-oriented way of life. Much debate has centered on the role of the state versus that of private exchange um, and market forces in the mid seventh century economy, particularly the knock-on effects of the cessation of the Leonona. The Leonona was a ration issued to soldiers, usually in the form of pay, while the Anona Civica was a bread and commodity handout to the various segments of the population in Constantinople. But the term has come to encapsulate the entire state-driven movement of grain to the capital for taxation and redistribution. The Mbole grain tax, levied in particular on Egypt, um, although large grain shipments also came from Sicily and North Africa by the early 7th century, involved, it is thought, roughly 500 ships in three rotations per year to transport it all, transport it all to the capital. Previously utilizing state-owned ships, uh, after Justinian, the owners of private ships were compensated by the state for carrying the grain. Uh, and could supplement their cargoes with other goods to sell en route. These private ships could be bigger than those the, not involved in the grain route, as their construction was subsidized by the state and they likely paid no custom dues. The loss of their car cargoes was also borne, at least in part, by the state, reducing the risk of making such a journey. The trunk routes these ships traveled from Egypt and North Africa to Constantinople, tied the empire together with a significant stopping point identified on the south coast of Cyprus near Ayos Georgios, right next to where there's now a really nice fish restaurant. <clears throat> uh, several scholars had held that the private market, um, which no one denies existed alongside the state-driven trade, far outweighed the importance of the Anona routes, while more recently McCormick, uh, Wickham, and Holden have taken the opposite position. Given the ceramic evidence, uh, I tend to come down on the side of the substantivist, substantivists and see the hand of the state in much of the economic movements of the seventh century uh, and in its uh, withdrawal and subsequent decline. The ubiquitous red slip dining wares of the empire, African, Fakan, and Cypriot, all benefited from these routes, supplementing grain cargoes moving across the empire, as did Gazan wine, and other products such as textiles and oil that likely would not have traveled as far or as freely without state support. Indeed, following the temporary loss of Egypt to the Persians in 618, the permanent end of free bread distribution in the capital and the subsequent loss of Palestine, Egypt, and North Africa to the Arabs by the mid seventh century, we see on Cyprus, but also in the wider Eastern Mediterranean the contraction that I mentioned previously. Economic regionalism seems to have been of the order of the day, with a series of overlapping spheres of economic interaction far closer to home than had been the case under the state-driven system. Southern Italy appears to remain connected to the coastal Balkans, the Peloponnese, and the Southern Aegean, while Constantinople gathered in the Black Sea and the Aegean littoral. Southern Anatolia, Cyprus, and areas outside the empire, primarily, primarily the Levant, largely maintained their own sphere. A substantial recovery in long distance trade does not appear until really the 10th century. 
gathering numerous strands of evidence, McCormick uh, has convincingly argued that long distance trade did still exist, um, if far more infrequently. And indeed, trade goods from further afield would likely have taken on greater contextual value through their consumption, uh, a point to which I'll return in a moment. Fundamentally, our understanding of these centuries has been conditioned by the ceramic data, data or rather the lack thereof, as the circulation of lead seals and coinage also experienced a dramatic collapse around the same time. Sites from this period have been very difficult to identify on Cyprus, and even in those formerly major centers, most occupation had, until very recently, been consigned to the dubious category of squatter habitation. I hate that term so much. Every time you look through old um, site reports, they get up to the seventh century and they're like, well, and then there was some squatter habitation, but that's not important. <laughs> they don't bother to record it, of course, in most cases. Um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, however, uh, no matter how circumstantial. And work over the last decade has begun to add nuance to the picture. We now know that the formerly ubiquitous red slip fine wares do not disappear suddenly in the later seventh century, as had been previously thought, but rather peter out over almost a hundred years with significant retention in select locations and from previously unutilized sources. Coarse wares and even handmade wares similar to the so-called Slavic ware of the Greek peninsula come to dominate and though exceedingly difficult to separate from Neolithic pottery in many cases, I know I've tried, um, work has begun on establishing a typology. To date, only one kiln that may bridge the gap has been found at St. George's Hill in Nicosia, far inland. Um, but there is confidence that more will be discovered, um, although uh, perhaps, perhaps in, in association with some of the church foundations that through architectural analysis have now been, we've started to pin churches to this period. There are some exceptions to this general picture, um, which I'll get to in a second, but overall the somatic landscape of cooking and dining in Cyprus from the seventh to the ninth centuries can be described as considerably drab, as drab as this pottery. Um, one scholar has even des described the handmade corpus as extremely coarse with of an apparently careless finish. Meals would have consisted of the Mediterranean triad of bread, oil, and wine, alongside stews consisting primarily of legumes um, for the majority of the population, supplemented with fish and meat when religiously or economically viable. Uh, fruits and cheese would have been seasonally available, um, but imports would have been rare. All of this eaten off of plain courseware ceramic vessels um, or vessels made of perishable materials such as wood. Um, and there was a, a lively debate a couple decades ago about whether or not they were even using pottery at all during this period. Um, and uh, people maintaining stridently that they must have been eating off of wood for 300 years just because they felt like it. Um, the exceptions to this general picture are telling and are concentrated largely in the ports. Obviously there is a class element at work here as well, but this does not preclude an, an intersection at work, or this does not preclude an intersection between class and location. Indeed, it depends on it. One vessel that does cross the locational divide are Gazan LRA-5 uh, amphora, um, although it's unclear if these are always evidence of primary usage. In any case, a small scale trade with the Levant clearly continues during the seventh to the ninth centuries, with a gradual transition to LRA-13 or globular amphorae that become the standard transport vessel through the Eastern Mediterranean in the early Middle Ages. Um, while Cypriot red slip, which may be made in either Cyprus or Pisidia or both, um, we're still not sure, continues in much reduced numbers at many sites, particularly along the coast until the eighth century. An interesting anomaly occurs at the port cities of Paphos and Corion in the late seventh. Just as the disruption of the red slip trade networks from Tunisia and Fouquet are taking place, there is a jump, a weird jump, in Egyptian red slip at these two sites. Previously extremely rare outside of Egypt, this may indicate a concerted effort to bring older, more established forms of dining ware uh, into the ports, where, it must be noted, they apparently remained, even if only short-lived. At the port site of Salamis Constantia, the capital of the island in the late Roman period, 
excavations prior to 1974 and covered a gymnasium and bath complex and an oil mill, both of which showed signs of late 7th and 8th century use. Here, in addition to imported LRI, LRA 5 amphorae from the Levant, including a rare painted example, um, were found cooking pots with twisted handles manufactured in Constantinople, as well as a type of fineware used like, utilizing an early form of lead glaze, um, also from Constantinople. This is really the best picture I could find of these things. They're not attractive. Um, and as such, archaeologists have been loath to photograph them well over the, uh, the last few decades. So this is what you're getting, unfortunately. To my knowledge, these cooking pots, the ones with the twisty handles, um, have not been found elsewhere on the island. And the fineware, uh, glazed whiteware, uh, is extremely rare, occurring only in small numbers at other port, port sites. These sites include formerly major coastal centers, including Corian, Paphos, Amethyst, and Polis. Notably, Justin Leidwiner has discussed secondary or what he terms opportunistic ports near major coastal settlements. He posits that in late antiquity, these secondary beach sites take on a considerable amount of traffic just outside the environs of the urban area. These sites, which include Akrotiri for Kurian, Yeroskipu or Aeus Yorgios for Paphos, and Zigi Petrini for Amathus, while initially without port or harbor, harbor facilities, by the seventh century so, so show signs of their own urban development, including churches and industrial facilities. While it is unclear if this move to sites away from the main urban center is due to the silting up of harbors or a desire to avoid taxation, um, they had become semi-permanent by the period we are discussing and also show quantities of that Constantinopolitan glazed whiteware. This brings us to the site of Saranda Colones, uh, a 13th century crusader castle located next to the port of Paphos. Excavated between 1975 and 1983 by a team initially from the Cyprus Department of Antiquities and then finalized by the British School of Archaeology at Athens. The site was instrumental in defining some of the defensive features adopted by the Crusaders from earlier Byzantine examples, as soundings indicated that one such fortification predated the Crusader construction. It's a very nice castle. Within these soundings were found substantial 7th century deposits as well as an ash layer that was thought to date to the Arab sack of the city in 653. Above this ash layer, in one sounding, the remains of a glass factory were discovered, including a type of high, um, which included a, a type of high-slung amphora with parallels in Constantinople and the Black Sea, dating solidly to the 8th century, as well as late 8th and early 9th century glazed whiteware dishes. These are nicer ones. A further re-examination of the glass factory material in 2003 by John Hayes further identified late Cypriot red slip and Gazan wine amphora in the earliest levels, as well as an early 8th century Umayyad wheel ridged wine jar, painted Palestinian amphorae, and later globular amphorae from numerous locations in the Eastern Mediterranean. A previously unidentified Lycian whiteware in mottled orange to gray surface wash, more glazed whiteware, two Constantinopolitan cooking pots, and a fragments of glazed chafing dishes were also found. These chafing dishes are of a type that were produced in Constantinople, as well as Greece and Anatolia in a coarser fabric, uh, incorporating the new glazing technology and used to heat a beverage or sauce at table. I love these. You put a little like coal or something in the bottom, right? Clever. Um, so this example actually is from Corinth and is in the uh, Byzantine Museum in Athens right now. Uh, a painted Egyptian bowl with vermilion and purplish black decorations also turned up. And I love that the excavators used vermilion in discussing it. Uh, further 9th century pottery was also identified, but not described in detail by Hayes in that publication. An additional sounding showed further Egyptian connections with two types of late 7th century Egyptian red slip and Egyptian bag and carrot amphora and even Cypriot copies of these. Handmade local pottery also appeared throughout, throughout both coarse wares and transport vessels. 
Most of these ceramics have few, if any, identified parallels elsewhere on the island. From this, particularly the fact that many are imports that should have been identified in sites that are thought to have extended into the 8th century, including Soli, Curium, Telemus Constantia, and Amethyst, we can deduce that the somewhat special character of the port, um, we can somewhat deduce the somewhat special character of the port at Paphos in early medieval Cyprus. The testimonies of St. Willibald and St. Constantine the Jew speak of seeing Ishmaelites on the island during their brief tenures there in the 8th and 9th centuries, respectively. And Paphos would certainly have been the first port of call for travelers, travelers coming from the West. Although a few Arabic tombstones and lead seals are known from in and around the city, the extent and character of Muslim settlement at the site during this period is much debated, um, with scholarship generally coming down on the side of negligible um, if not non-existent entirely. Still, the presence of painted wares, uh, similar to, to those in the Levant from this period, such as this Jerash bowl, um, as well as transport amphorae from Egypt and Palestine, point to continuing connections with the Arab world on the part of the Paphians, and the implications of this, as well as the general lack of penetration to the rest of the island of these wares, as well as the advanced glazed material from Constantinople and elsewhere is significant for our discussion of ports and heterotopic space. As previously noted, a key element of a heterotopia, heterotopia is a differential experience of time. This heterochronic character is suggested by the ceramic material that we've just discussed, and the somatic experience of dining in port cities as composed with, compared with those in the interior of the island. The maintenance of Cypriot red slip long after the trade networks that supported the easy flow of such material uh, bespeaks a certain conservatism in dining practices, an impression that is strongly reinforced by the anomalous appearance of Egyptian red slip in both Paphos and Corian. One might even call it a nostalgia. To what extent then does this production of other space or other time provide a venue for differential consumption that is tied to shared material practices of social cohesion? Such communities of practice articulate and ne negotiate identity, as previously noted. And this has important implications for how we might judge Romanitas at a time of shifting priorities within the Byzantine Empire. While much of the discussion around Byzantine identity has centered on literary communities and a retention of a classical Hellenic identity at the highest levels of society, I think that an additional focus on shared material practices at other social levels is also instructive, particularly given the apparent lack of centrif centrifugal control in some provinces in the seventh and eighth centuries. There's also a flip side to this. By the late seventh century, glazed whiteware is appearing in small quantities in port cities in Cyprus, as I mentioned. This is the, the nicer glazed whiteware, which also doesn't seem to have any pictures of it. You usually find it in such tiny fragments that's still not worth photo photo photographing it yourself. This new technology is not only aesthetically pleasing, or at least it becomes so, but also provides practical insulation in a way far superior to the previous practice of slipping ceramics. No more would bowls and cups absorb an angel's share of their contents, and they're easier to clean as well. I'm reminded of a quote by the cyberpunk author and Vancouver resident, William Gibson. The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. This is a future technology coming from outside that creates a somatically distinct dining experience, one outside of normal time and located within the heterotopic space of port society. Remember how Japan was often characterized in Western media in the 80s and 90s as this kind of futuristic place? I guess that trope continues somewhat, um, but this has important implications for how we think about Romanitas in Cyprus and more broadly, particularly as this takes place during a period when local elites are being replaced with Constantinopolitan bureaucrats at a provincial level. Obviously, the rich have always dined richer in antiquity, often with metallic vessels, but the extension of this to ceramic forms, the breakdown in interregional trade contract, contacts, and the emergence of, a distinctly, of distinctly regional traditions of pottery points to a different type of horizontal as well as vertical social differentiation in the empire, one tied to heterotopic space and port society. 
In the Cypriot case, the evidence from Paphos provides clues that this may have extended to the dishes being prepared as well. The presence of a ceram of ceramic forms from further afield in the ninth century, unattested elsewhere on the island, and a, an ephemeral, perhaps merchant-based Arab presence coincides with what Corey Durak has identified as the beginnings of a greater movement in ephemera, including spices and other foodstuffs from the east into the Mediterranean. The Abbasid Caliphate had different priorities than its Umayyad predecessor. And with a shift in focus to the Indian Ocean and Central Asia, new trade networks were opening up, with the Caliphate acting as a middleman for the Mediterranean world. With this kind of potential access, the port of Paphos must have seemed like another world, a liminal space of delights as well as moral corruption. I will leave you with an additional example of the utility of this approach for outside of Cyprus. The tiny island of Syra lies off the northeastern coast of Crete and in the ninth century was home to a small monastery. Now, monasteries are an, an obvious example of heterotopic space liminal, and were this a different audience, one might suspect one maintaining a more retrograde sense of time. The ceramics from 9th century Psyra paint a very different story, however, with the latest in glazed Constant Constantinopolitan whiteware and chafing dishes, both from the capital and regional markets um, in large numbers. Gazan wine amphora are also in evidence, as are um, a Palestinian lamp, pointing to a heterotopic engagement with food and dining more akin to a port like Paphos than one might expect for a small, isolated monastery. This raises interesting questions about how their material culture is mediating their sense of identity, both horizontally and vertically, within a society from, from which they are set apart. To conclude, as we enter the third year of the pandemic and heterotopias proliferate around us, does it feel like the third year or the third month? An examination of, different of differential consumption and heterotopic space in the past has important resonances for the present. How are our own object worlds changing as a result of COVID? Or our sense of identity based on shared material experiences? What does a breakdown in connectivity do to a sense of local identity? How might we be teased with the future, even as differential access and other space keep it from us? And here I had a paragraph about Elon Musk, but I decided to take it out. <clears throat> the archeology span of late antique and early medieval Cyprus can help us here. It has things to say about how these processes work and what the follow on effects may be. As we consume and connect in the shadow of COVID, COVID and the climate crisis, we need to think about how we want our sense of community to change going forward and how our shared material experiences in space and time affect that dynamic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Ooh, the echo. Am I muted? Good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for this, and thank you for uh, uh, for synthesizing a lot of material that, uh, interestingly enough, connects with conversations we have been having uh, independently here in um, a number of seminars. Um, before I uh, open it up to uh, everyone else, uh, I'd like to to think a bit about this uh, Egyptian uh, uh, material that uh, you seem to trace and uh, seems to appear in periods where you would expect a greater disruption of this kinds of connection and. Uh, to move from Cyprus itself to, e to, to, to Egypt, to think about ways in which uh, uh, communities built around harbors resist empire mm -hmm. and, and its uh, uh, desire for control. Because at the same time that uh, uh, the uh, Muslim authorities in, uh, in Egypt are uh, uh, ensuring that you stop the shipping of grain supplies to Constantinople, uh, you have these harbor communities uh, with their workshops still producing for the enemy, who is not, of course, their enemy. They might right. be ethnically or uh, ideologically or religiously connected still. 
So and the south coast of Cyprus has very very strong traditional connections with Egypt. Oh, the way the Ptolemies. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I mean, and that's where the currents dump you. If you get in a boat in Alexandria and just let the current take you, it'll dump you on the south coast of Cyprus. You don't even have, you don't have to do much. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really I mean those connections are very very strong. It it's it makes sense to me that they would that that's where they would go if they if the 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 grain ships are no longer coming if the red slips that are normally carried are not are not there but they want to eat off of they want to engage in the shared material practices that they have been using to you know perhaps subconsciously to differentiate themselves or to at least that, that form an important part of this their shared material experiences of romanitas it makes sense that they would go to egypt for that Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunate that we don't have comparenda from the northern part of the island. Um, there's been no legal excavation there since 1974, of course. So Carinia, we have no information on. Uh, in 1974, they, they really lacked the ability to identify a lot of this stuff. So we, we don't know um, what's going on there, unfortunately. I mean, also interestingly, talking about the, the connections between these two communities and the ways that um, port societies resist empire. I mean, one just has to look at the, the uh, siege of Constantinople and the revolt of the, uh, of the Egyptian sailors. Um, these are exactly the type of people who are participating in this, in this kind of thing. And it doesn't go so well for, for the Umayyads there. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I would like to point out for uh, uh, our audience online that uh, you could submit questions on the Q&A uh, box or even uh, uh, through, through the chat uh, function. Uh, and before I open it up to this room, I will actually uh, go uh, to our online audience and to uh, Zainab Olgun and, um, and just read. So uh, thank you uh, so much for this amazing presentation, Ian. Uh, it was very inspiring. My question is related to uh, the perhaps more philosophical part of your paper. Do you see each and every uh, port as a heterotopic space with the hustle and bustle uh, as you have proposed, or do you think there is a certain hierarchy of ports regarding their sizes and connectivity? Yes. I mean, I think it, I think it, it I think it really yeah, it depends on sort of the connective fabric to which they are, into which they're woven. Um, you could have, I mean, small, you know, small cove harbors that are just trading locally, and there the 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 material experience and the sense of time um, are are not going to be much affected. Uh, it depends on what sort of goods you're bringing in. It depends on the the ways that those goods kind of mediate um, an understanding of one's position in space and time. So, and the sorts of people that are coming there as well. And this is again, it's about the kind of somatic experience of port society. So, if it's if it's a dinky little port that's not very you know not really happening, um, I mean. What are the chances for moral corruption there? Probably not very high. Uh, or in getting like an interesting meal or finding products that aren't going to be available otherwise. Um, yeah, I think there is there is really a hierarchy in that sense. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jake? Um, thanks for this. Yeah, I, this might be a totally impossible question for a speaker. I love those. I, I'm interested in what they do in these issues, right? And uh, then the food itself, eat itself, right? And how that can factor into thinking about um, the food experience is preserving a technical money class, a shared experience, uh, in terms of just you know, what we did for the eating, especially when you had an added level of complexity that you, Cyprus is now in between. Religious cultures that, in theory at least, have certain distinctive food ways. I mean, there, there, there are plenty of uh, Muslim drinking wine, of course, but in theory, we're not supposed to be uh, eating pork, that kind of thing, right? So, so again, do we have any sense, kind of materially or theologically, how that might play into some of these phenomena that you discussed when it comes to nostalgia or anything like this? I mean, that's uh, an excellent question because that was my dissertation. Um, and the answer is nope. <laughs> <laughs> I looked. Um, I looked very hard. 
uh, it's the, the, in this case, the ceramics are acting as a proxy. Um, they, they are what we have. And, and this period, um, because nobody knew what the ceramics looked like for so long, it, it's only really gotten attention over the last 15 years, maybe, um, by two other people and me. So at least for Cyprus, there's, it's not a popular period. Um, it doesn't have, I mean, you saw the pottery, it's ugly as sin. Um, it's, it's really like, it, and, and traditionally archeologists like to dig things that are pretty, you know? I mean, how many sites have the pal, you know, the palace has been dug and the, uh, I mean, I was at Ayos Georgios uh, and I was talking to an unnamed excavator um, and uh, the church, the, the church had been excavated. And I asked, um, um, should be saying this online probably. Uh, I asked uh, about the, the settlement um, that was associated with the church. Uh, and they looked at me and said, what settlement? Because it just hadn't, that, they were interested in the church. Uh, the, that, that was the, you know, the, the place where you want to dig. It's where the, the, the nice stuff is. Um, and so looking at the pottery from this period, the course wares and things, um, it's not attractive. People haven't really wanted to work on this. Uh, and so the typology is only just now being built, um, which is you know, ridiculous considering that we had a typology for the first seventh century fine wares in the early seventies. Uh, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. So, so really, I mean, the, the, the ceramics are offering, are acting as the proxy here. No work has been done on like residue analysis, for example. Um, this is also a period that doesn't have a lot of texts. So we don't have much in the way of, you know, an Apicius writing things down or something. So, so we do with what we, with what we can. Um, a lot of our information about, about foodways comes from um, uh, the Ekloga and, and, uh, and, uh, the book of the Epark. Uh, so, so laws dealing with the selling of food in Constantinople itself. When you're talking about the provinces. Yeah. We have a question. So thank you for this yeah. great talk. I was, it was very interesting for me. And I also work on a regional design too, with renowned with its sports, Catalonia. Hmm. Um, and I also, it's similarly like goes from a safe space to become like a frontier zone, et cetera. So it was very interesting. So I had a question about, uh, maybe like a follow-up more than a question, but perhaps I wanted to find out your thoughts on it. Um, so how do we reconcile the idea of the rise of private shipping, which you were discussing? Uh, and Theofan has also discussed into kind of contracting out of the grain shipping. With this idea, so going off the example from Catalonia, we have Empress Theodora, who's from a wealthy um, merchant family. And we, we know from uh, Theophanes, the continuation of Theophanes, that when the emperor finds out about her grain ship in Constantinople, he burns it down and like confiscates and burns down the ship, right? So how do we reconcile this idea of the rise of private shipping, but it being shunned in high society? And can this kind of build into ports as heterotrophic spaces, perhaps, as a thought? Or? I think absolutely. I think that that there needn't be an absolute um, overlap between the the differential access provided by these heterotrophic spaces of ports and high society. And I mean, indeed, the the particularly in this period. Um, it's it's your connections to constant it's not necessarily your wealth it's your connections to constantinople that define your social importance in, in a lot of ways so yeah i think that that's it you can see something else going on here something potentially outside of um normal social hierarchies as we kind of understand them from you know a top-down sort of imperial kind of kind of level um and also this is really really interesting in thinking about how um romanitas is mediated during this during this period um what makes her what makes a roman a roman um 
is a, a wealthy Isaurian, a Roman, is, you know, like how, how does that work? How do they engage, at what level do they engage with the shared material practices of Roman society? And to what extent does that make them a Roman or not? And port society can, can be really instrumental there in terms of, of carving out a different sphere within which um, these, these material practices take shape. 